Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tools of the Trade, Reaching New and Underrepresented Audiences. I'm Julie Fry, President and CEO of California Humanities, and we're very glad to have you join us here today. If this is your first time with us, let me tell you that California Humanities is a statewide nonprofit organization. Um, we're an independent nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And for the last 47 years or so, we've been making grants and delivering public humanities programs throughout California. So today is the fifth offering in our newest virtual series. We're focusing it on humanities capacity building on a variety of topics. Tools of the Trade, a practical series for humanities programmers, is, um, was developed to support public humanities providers like you to recover and rebuild in the wake of the pandemic and how the world is changing around us in a series of free online learning sessions over the coming year. We hope you'll join us in the coming months as we grapple with other topics of interest within our field, um, such as raising the visibility of your programs with media and decision makers. Uh, you can actually find videos of our past conversations on our website, such as a recent discussion on creating inclusive experiences for people of all abilities. Now I have the pleasure of introducing today's facilitator, Oliver Rosales, Professor of History at Bakersfield College. He's also a former visiting faculty at the Bard College Master of Arts in Teaching Program and visiting fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He's a contributor to the Chicano movement, Perspectives from the 21st Century, Civil Rights and Beyond, African-American and Latino activism in the 20th century United States, and the Journal of the West. His public history project, Mapping Common Ground, Agriculture, Labor, and Migration in Rural California, has just received prestigious public engagement fellowship from the Whiting Foundation. Congratulations, Oliver. And we're also very glad to have him as our board chair here at California Humanities. So Oliver, over to you. Oh, thanks so much, Julie, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and to help facilitate this conversation on a very, very important topic. Um, I consider myself a, a rural humanities practitioner. And so, you know, reaching a new and underrepresented audiences is something that I've been involved in for at least a decade. And again, I know that we're gonna get a lot out of uh, today's panel discussion. So uh, having said that, let me introduce our wonderful panelists for today. Uh, first, we have Emily uh, Cohen Ibanez. She is a Colombian American filmmaker based in Oakland, and she earned her doctorate in anthropology at New York University. Her film work pairs lyricism and social activism, advocating for labor, environmental, and health justice. As a video journalist, her work is regularly commissioned by The Intercept, The Guardian, and independent lens. And I believe um, she's joining us from afar today. Maybe she'll, she'll share a story about that. Uh, we also have uh, Karita Tinker, uh, born and raised in Southern California. Uh, for the last 15 years, she has served as a library aide, clerk, a technician, assistant, and librarian in five California libraries. At the Anaheim Public Library, she developed uh, library programming for youth and meaningful partnerships throughout the community. We're also joined by Dr. Tina Zarpur. Uh, she joined the San Diego History Center in March 2015 and currently serves as the Vice President of Education and Collections. Tina holds a Master in Applied Anthropology uh, and a PhD from the University of Maryland College Park. Her interests lie at the nexus of participatory and community-based archiving, collections management, cultural heritage exhibitions, and constructivist learning approaches. Finally, we have Cheryl Montel, uh, who's worn many hats, uh, starting as a professional dancer and an actress in her youth. She has run a Pilates fitness business. She is a writer and performs her own stories and currently conceived and curates Live from Joshua Tree, an annual community-based spoken word fundraiser for Milltree. Milltree was formed out of her wish to have the community at large embrace returning veterans and their families. So those are our four wonderful panel for panelists for today. I hope you'll join me in giving them a virtual welcome. Uh, just in terms of format, very briefly, uh, each presenter will present for about three minutes, uh, and then we'll have uh, time for a, a moderated uh, Q&A. And then at the end, we'll have some time for audience questions. But of course, along the way, if you have uh, thoughts, concerns, or questions, feel, please feel free to blow up the chat and or ask your question in the Q&A box and we promise to get to it at the end. 
but I will turn it over to Emily now as our first presenter. Emily. Thank you, Oliver. Wow, this is such an honor to be here with um, all of all the other panelists and California Humanities and um, California Humanities has been such a wonderful supporter uh, of my work and I, I'm uh, very grateful for that. I'm calling from, I'm in zooming in from Beijing, Colombia. I'm starting a new film project. So um, I hopefully will have, we should have pretty good internet connection. If it gets a little choppy in my end, I apologize in advance. And yes, I am here talking about my film, Fruits of Labor. It's a feature documentary film about a young woman, Ashley. She's a teenage farm worker and factory worker. And, you know, she dreams of uh, graduating, being the first in her family to graduate from high school and go to college. Oh, there's a little puppy. My cousin's puppy might join us, sorry. Um, <laughs> and um, he's six months. So he's just been jumping all over me uh, during meetings today. But, um, and it's a coming of age story of this young woman. Uh, and during a time after the election, when increased ice raids threatened to uh, separate her family and forces her to become the head breadwinner in her family, her, they're from a mixed status family. She and her siblings are born in the U.S. and her mom is undocumented. Um, and it's really a beautiful, lyrical kind of coming of age story. And here today, really, I just want to share um, about my social impact campaign and how we reach underrepresented audiences. So um, the film, you know, had its world premiere at South by Southwest, did its um, national broadcast on POV, PBS. Um, but, you know, what, from the very beginning, I felt that I wasn't sure if I was going to really be reaching the audiences most directly affected by what's featured in the film. And that's really the farm working community and community, um, rural communities working in low wage labor. And so to do, to reach those audiences, we created a campaign. I put together a team of really wonderful coordinators um, and Ashley, the protagonist is also part of the team. And we do these, do various things. Um, we do a large, uh, outdoor screenings throughout California, um, and we make resource fairs. So we have, for example, um, uh, we did a, a screening in Petaluma with the indigenous Chatino community, very large community in Sonoma County that work in the vineyards and currently are fighting um, to get hazard pay um, and uh, certain safety measures in their workplace because they're during fire season here in California, they're forced to really, they'll lose their jobs if they don't work during the fire seasons. And a lot of the um, wineries are asking them to work very fast paced. You know, they do night shifts um, when there's fire so that before the vineyards burn. And what happens is the smoke, any of you who've lived through these fires, um, the smoke. Oh, these are my, these are our youth ambassadors. This is in a Pyre Petaluma screening. Uh, these are all Chitino youth. Um, and, you know, they, their parents were forced to work in the fields um, and many have developed asthma. So anyway, they're really fighting and they're actually winning. They're actually winning, making wins. And our campaign is a part of, of the um, partners with several people in Sonoma. And in many ways, I've also done video journalism on this story, but um, so really the center of our, um, our campaign is women supporting women. And all of us are women of color and we're an intergenerational team that mentor each other as we bring forward um, the project. Here is um, one of our visuals. We also do social media. Um, and so this was for Women's Month. We highlighted women of the farm workers movement of yesterday and today. Um, so these are both historical figures and present day um, far leaders in the farm worker movement. Um, let's see what other picture shows up. <laughs> oh, this is my beautiful team. So um, this is the impact team, Victoria um, Muter Montijo. Uh, that's me, then Ashley, um, who's our protagonist and one of our keynote speakers at all of our events, and Lina Blanco, who's also a wonderful coordinator. And here we're in Watsonville. We partnered with University of California, Santa Cruz, um, the Center for Labor Studies, and they've created a wonderful research um, uh, 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 surveying over 100 
uh, immigrant families throughout the county, and it, um, they're presenting their research findings to the community, an event called We Belong, and then we were uh, one of the big draws for the event is what they, how they like to describe it. And so we partook in the event and then had our movie screen. Um, and it was a beautiful, uh, beautiful event. And um, uh, we had also youth ambassadors working with us and our film team, you know, I had a paid internship program all um, with college students in film at UC Santa Cruz. We're all first gen. Um, you know, the first to graduate from college. And I'm proud to say all of them graduated and together during the film, you know, there was all the challenges and ups and downs and everybody did it. Uh, and now Ashley here, who thought maybe she wouldn't, she was thought, oh, in my life, I'm supposed to just drop out of high school and, and you know, do farm and factory work for the rest of my life. Well, she's graduating now from her associate's degree um, from the community college and she's transferring uh, to San Jose State University. And she's already making plans and saving money to um, buy her own land to create hydroponics uh, strawberries because she has worked in the strawberry field since she was 15. I don't know if there's any more pictures. Ah, so this was really exciting. So through all of our social media and showing, by the way, you can follow us on Fruits of Labor Film. Our, that's basically fruitsoflaborfilm.com on our website. Fruits of Labor Film on Instagram, Fruits Labor Film on Twitter, and we also have a Facebook page. And through all of our showing of our outdoor events and these resource fairs that are kind of festivals in some way, well, the, in, from Ireland, the industrial workers of the world reached out to me and we did a screening, a May Day event. And it was beautiful because we had organizers from um, the union, this transnational union in Europe, and all of them were saying, they watched the film, they said, all of us can relate. Um, I was told this was a niche story from some distributors, I won't name who, but you know, it's so interesting. They said, well, we have the same thing in our agriculture, folks from Eastern Europe, folks from Morocco coming and they're also not treated with their full dignity and, and human rights. So it was a fascinating discussion comparing the US with European agriculture, especially now with everything that's happening. I, don't, I think there's one more image and that I really love. Um, I don't know how, how this is all working if I manage it or, there we go. This is from our Petaluma screening. So, you know, I had made a short intercept film with um, the woman who owns this barn. Um, her name is Maria Salinas, wonderful leader, an indigenous leader who advocates for linguistic justice for her community and also is a labor organizer and, and she picks grapes in the field. She's a vineyard worker. And so with all these partners, we put on this beautiful screening event and we had um, vaccines for people for COVID vaccines. We had blood pressure checks, diabetes checks, uh, resources on this botanical bus for herbal healing. A lot of them have uh, in the community a great amount of knowledge. You don't see in the pictures here, but um, this barn she built, a grower allows her to rent the land. She built this barn with her husband to do events for the community. And then she has an amazing, what you call milpa, and what I consider almost like a farm, but a beautiful with all mixed style of planting. She, every, all the flowers are planted by them, by their own seeds. They cultivate and use ritual. So everything has meaning here. Um, and they made, we break bread at every event, um, which we find really important for developing community. Here we had um, Maria and her friends uh, made chicken mole for everyone with fresh tortillas and tamales. And it was so sweet. One of our youth ambassadors, basically what they do is they take field notes. I'm an anthropologist, so I do a little workshop on taking field notes. They make their observations and they do some surveys of the attendees so we can gather data. And one of their observations is that people were eating tamales like popcorn. It was probably my favorite field note. Um, so this is really what we're doing and we're getting the word out. And we have our last big California event because we're running out of funds. It looks like someone has, it might pitch in so we can go, oh, this is from our Watsonville event with the flyer. So we can go to Bakersfield to be with Dolores Huerta and do an outdoor thing there. So we're seeing if that comes through. But our, for sure, we're going to do um, an event with 300 migrant families at a migrant camp in the San Joaquin Valley. That's the Central Valley here. 
um, and people will pick, they come, they traveled between Mexico and the US. Oh, this was a screening event we did in Sonoma in a, the Raven Theater, beautiful. And this is Ashley holding one of the pamphlets because we are a part of the worker safety um, five for five campaign. So we join campaigns and our idea is to create um, to, for all these orgs, we have over 40 partners to meet and to work together. Um, I have my own dreams that this, the union efforts become transborder and transnational. And those are the dreams of many of the organizers. So we we're also working in Mexico. Um, we don't have the, all the funds that we had imagined, but we're really excited because uh, we're starting to get into film festivals there. And we have an impact producer in Mexico City gathering um, orgs who can come to the festival screenings. Uh, we have the person who did our original song for our film is a pop star in Mexico, uh, Denise Gutierrez from Hello Seahorse. She'll be doing a free concert. Um, we'll show the film and then we're creating a, a package so people in Mexico can organize screenings on their own that are pertinent to their organizations. So that's um, in a nutshell, what we're doing with the Fruits of Labor Social Impact Campaign. And again, thank you, California Humanities. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this amazing panel. Thank you, Emily, that was wonderful. Um, next up is Tina. I just wanna say though, before Emily, you, you know you have to jump off in a few minutes. There were a couple of questions in the Q&A. If you do have the ability to check them out, please, please do so, but thank you. My goodness, Emily, that was wonderful. And I'll follow up on you about Bakersfield too. I wanna to know more about that, uh, but let, let's go to Tina. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with uh, esteemed colleagues in, in the humanities. Um, so just a little bit about my project. I'm wondering, Kristen, if you could, uh, great, start the slides. So uh, my name is Tina Zarpour. I'm the Vice President of Community Engagement Collections and Education at the San Diego History Center. We are in um, Balboa Park, Historic Balboa Park. We run two Museums. This is our main one. I'm, I'm actually in the building today and you see the front of the building um, as my background and on the slide. So next slide. Um, so this project was called Welcome to the Mix. Each of us has a story. Um, it initiated in January of 2019 and pretty much concluded by January of 2019 with the, with the public history component of it um, at our physical space. So uh, it consisted of a team composed of myself and three others, and these other folks were um, consultants, and they had all substantive connections in other communities, both geographically and ethnically, racially. Um, and the project was focused on collecting personal interviews, audio and videotaped oral histories, and other material from primarily four communities that are currently underrepresented in the museum's collections programs and exhibitions. And those were the native indigenous community in our region, Latin, Latinx and Mexican American community, the Filipino community and the black community. And it was, Welcome to the Mix was centered on expanding the History Center's oral history collection, which dates back to the early 1950s. So currently we have about 1700 oral histories in the collection and really to add also more contemporary voices and, and be purposeful and intentional about seeking oral histories that were not represented within the collection. Um, I think Kristen, next slide. So when all was said and done, uh, we had about 55 participants in just over a year's time, which was a great boon for our institution's collections. You can see most of the portraits here. We had 55 participants. We ended up with about 30 something portraits. So the material that we collected was audio tape, video tape, um, photos, personal ephemera, um, kind of a mixed bag of things, but we wanted to create something unifying for the public that was also very humanizing and very visual and worked within our budget and our physical location as, as a museum. So um, a little bit of, you know, organizing and, you know, boring things like file naming nomenclature and downloading things and making sure everything was sort of, we had the same sorts of materials from, from everybody. Um, what was really advantageous, well, the challenge was how to collate it into something for an exhibit, all of these diverse stories and perspectives. So we were able to take advantage of some in-house talent. Um, some of our on, um, photo archivists are also double as, as photographers. 
and we have an in-house studio. So we invited as, as many, we invited all of the people that we interviewed um, on site to the History Center. We asked them to bring something meaningful to them in terms of an object, because we are an object-based kind of um, institution and staged these wonderful uh, black and white portraits that we printed all at um, uniform size and um, hung in the gallery in one of our gallery spaces. Kristen, if you wanna advance the slide. Um, so this is also an example of a video component. So not everything was just um, audio and stills. We also collected videos when we could. Um, one of the projects within the project was something called the Kumeyaay Oral History Project. Uh, which we received funding from some local tribes um, to do that. And that was um, a nice collaboration between two different projects that we were both, that the institution was embarking on. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is the invite. You can see we use these portraits. Um, I mean, they're just beautiful, um, quite, quite a bit in the marketing of the program um, and continue to use them in our e-blast. We highlight certain stories in our, in our monthly newsletters and things like that. Um, so you can see the sort of the philosophy. We're very open about communicating the philosophy of what oral history is in terms of as a historical institution and the power of oral history and trying to translate that. But you know, besides that, we had a very light touch to what we did in the exhibit. And, and it was really just the portraits and the voices um, because you know most of these video, most of these interviews were an hour to two hours long. We couldn't obviously um, have them playing in the in the exhibition, so we selected clips, uh, snippets, um, audio snippets that people could select and listen to within the space as well. So next slide. Um, this was the opening event. You can um, see um, our panel on the left and what it looked like in the gallery space and and people kind of crowding around and looking. And then the next few slides just really um, showcase the, the public event um, at the opening for the, for the exhibition. If you can advance the slide. Um, people love to pose with their portraits, right? Families posing in front of the portraits. Um, I think you can just kind of keep advancing through. Um, yeah, so then just quickly, just another kind of part that emerged besides the Kumeyaay Oral History Project was a kind of a mini focus on the Black Panthers of San Diego. So we ended up, I think, interviewing five or six uh, Black Panthers or a part of the original Black Panther Party in San Diego. You can see two of them here standing on in the picture on the left. So that kind of became its own potential resource for future, um, future people that are interested in, in researching that and looking at it as well. And that's it. All right, thank you so much, uh, Emily. That was, um, or Tina, excuse me, that was uh, wonderful. I was just saying goodbye to Emily because she j jumped off. I think she had to go in Columbia. Um, let's go to number three with uh, Karita. Hello, um, I just want to thank California Humanities for this amazing opportunity. And I want to acknowledge the wonderful work that my esteemed colleagues have done. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so my name is Karita and I do work at the Anaheim Public Libraries. I work specifically at the Haskett Branch Library. And the city of Anaheim is a multi-ethnic community with people from various backgrounds, experiences, and cultures. Um, Anaheim is not only home to Mickey Mouse and Disneyland, but home to 350,000 residents. And we aim to serve and engage all of these diverse populations. Of those 350,000 residents, we have a large Latino and ca Caucasian population, but we also have an Arab population that is seldomly recognized. This immigrant community is growing importance to the city and the county's economy and culture. In 2021, I applied and received the California Humanities Library Innovation Lab grant exploring new ways of engaging immigrant communities through public humanity programming. During this grant period, I was able to research, design, and implement a small scale, short-term public humanities project at the Haskett Library. And of course, I focus on the Arab community. These are people hailing from Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, and Syria. My project was entitled 
Allah wa salam, which means welcome in Arabic. My project focused on meeting the needs of the community with respect to representation and cultural awareness. I hope to foster a better understanding of the Arab community through a wide variety of programs, experiences, and services that highlighted the contribution of Arab immigrants in Anaheim and throughout history. So, and those are the pictures I have. Um, those were some of the examples of the things that we did. But um, in November and December of 2021, um, the Haskett Library hosted a traveling interpretive exhibition curated by the Arab American National Museum. Um, we had an array of programs such as an Arabic and English story time and crafting sessions for the families. We also had cooking demonstrations and a virtual visit by author Linda Sassor and related book discussions and performances of traditional Arab dance and music. The project was developed in response to the needs expressed by the immigrant community population. So furthermore, the goals of these programs and experiences were to promote inclusion, spark conversation and uplift each other. Again and again, I found that regardless of the culture, there is a common thread that connects all of us and we must be willing to embrace each other and learn from one another. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kirita, for that presentation. Um, let's go to our, our, our final presentation before we move to the uh, sort of moderated Q&A. Uh, Cheryl? Uh, hi, thank you, Oliver. And um, I am so honored to be participating today. Thank you, California Humanities. And this is such an inspiring panel. Um, Miltree Veteran Project is um, the name of the organization that I am the founder and executive director of, and we are in Joshua Tree, California. And veterans are definitely an underserved group within our society. Just so you know what our mission is, it's to create community between veterans, active duty and civilians by building bridges through the arts, inclusive dialogue and shared projects. We really believe that the connection to community transforms service-related distress and isolation while easing transition to civilian life. So we create a variety of opportunities to interact with civilians in a supportive and creative environment, whether it's through the arts, we, all, we do all kinds of arts projects and workshops or participating in a community build or digging a little deeper relating personal experiences through heart to heart dialogue like with the Art of Resilience, our three day online retreat where we explored the difficulties of returning home from military service. Um, if you want to show the one a couple the the flyer I have, Kristen, you can do that now. This took place in May of 2020. Um, you know, we were going to do this live, but um, COVID hit. So we, we quickly um, transferred it to an online uh, retreat. And our facilitators were diverse and experienced in using transformative approaches that combined art and humanity-based modalities. So uh, the lead facilitator was Dr. Ed Tick, a psychotherapist who has worked with many, many veterans and authored the book, War in the Soul, Healing Our Nation's Veterans from Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. He also had his own uh, 501c3 called Soldier's Heart. Uh, we also had Miguel Rivera, a social activist, drummer, and healer dedicated to supporting veterans through ceremony and ritual. Ben Dennis also was a facilitator, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, first responder, and mythologist specializing in psychodrama and storytelling. And finally, but not least, of course, Leilani Squire. She came from a military family. She's a writer and the founder of Returning Soldiers Speak, a nonprofit dedicated to helping veterans write and tell their story. So what Miltree did was we adapted many aspects of Dr. Tick's approach that support and speak to warriorhood. We utilize poetry, mythology, and literature through the ages related to warriors and warfare. We use creative writing exercises, readings, and small group discussions. We utilize practices and rituals such as drumming, altar building, guided imagery, and tales from other warrior cultures to demonstrate the warrior's journey through life. 
We also, at the end, created an online reading and anthology of the writings of our participants. And so within the comfort of their own home, veterans and civilians alike created a threshold into their own sacred space where they built personal altars, one to beauty and one to grief. Um, Kirsten, if you can show that now, um, just so you can see um, the altars that um, one of our participants built or not. And I'll just keep talking and maybe they'll come up. and. Uh, the three days of the retreat flowed between the various exercises. Um, okay, so here is, um, this is the um, altar to grief. And the next one will be the altar to beauty. Um, so, and what happened in the retreat is, is they really, you know, contemplated what these altars meant to them and certain things shifted from one altar to the other. Some of the grief then ended up on the um, altar for beauty. We all did this in our own homes. And uh, when we were not, when the veterans and participants were not sharing their own stories, the group was holding space and bearing witness. This was a crucial aspect of the retreat to help create a safe environment where transformation could take place. Um, we know it was successful because we did surveys throughout the retreat and we deem, and, and even though at the beginning the retreat, there was a lot of apprehension uh, via the surveys, uh, by the end, um, the information we were getting documented um, a lot of joy and a lot of benefit. And, you know, one of the main goals of Art of Resilience was to begin the process of really coming home to transform the trauma of war into well-being. And uh, basically that's really um, Miltree's goal as a whole. So we were thrilled to be able to um, have a grant from California Arts, uh, sorry, from California Humanities, as well as other one other grant. And um, we we um, we did something profound. So thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, Cheryl. That's a wonderful um, presentation. Uh, you know, I come from a family of veterans, and I, I have some colleagues uh, who are working with Filipino American veterans in, the, in August. So I'm going to pass along some of your programming ideas uh, to them because I can see how it can be used from a lot of different communities. Um, so let's go ahead and move into the sort of uh, moderated uh, Q&A portion of this. Um, uh, Emily did have to jump off, although she did want me to pass along to the audience that. Um, uh, we're going to try to get the questions that you had for her specifically to her email so she can correspond with folks that way. Um, but for uh, Tina, Kirita, and Cheryl, I'm going to ask uh, some questions and feel free to jump in if you feel uh, so moved by a particular question. Uh, keeping in mind the audience, right, that is interested in reaching, you know, new or underserved uh, humanities uh, publics, um, what kind of strategies were successful, uh, specifically, you know, with outreach or partnerships for, for reaching, um, you know, these sort of underrepresented communities? What, what strategies proved successful for, for your projects? Um, I can go first um, and sort of jump in. I guess um, audiences is, is sometimes, you know, being working in museums and the humanities for 20 something years, can be a fraught word or, or a loaded word. And I guess my lesson that I've learned is, is really not to treat audiences as passive, but active. And um, you know that aligns with some of our other philosophies within our, my current institution at the History Center where we uh, don't use the word curator um, anymore because it's sort of assuming a certain set of, of of expertise that only lie with certain people. Um, and so audiences is not as, as not passive, but active and as, as creators and uh, with stories that are worth documenting. And, um, you know, a museum for, for good and for bad st still means something. And for, for you to be, for you to be represented in a museum, for somebody to be, have their story represented in a museum still counts a lot. Um, so we can use that to our, our advantage. Um, and so that's the buy-in and the hook, right? Um, and that's that's the sort of 
what's at stake is is that that being represented adequately and correctly and truthfully and then having that story preserved forever so thank you Tina. <laughs> anyone else want to comment on the idea of strategies for success uh well i i was just gonna say that um normally in most of our projects that we do and including art of resilience um we partner with different organizations. Um, I mean, that, that is a main strategy. Um, and, you know, this time we were able to use um, some, some of the um, participants came from some of the facil facilitators nonprofits. Ed Tick had a nonprofit, Miguel Rivera had a nonprofit, Leilani had a nonprofit. And, um, you know, and then in Joshua Tree up here in the high desert, you know, uh, I reached out to several organizations, Mojave Desert Land Trust, um, uh, the Joshua Tree Retreat Center, High Desert Test Sites. I mean, basically I would network as, much as I could, um, the U USC LA the LA Collaborative, which is um, a veteran organization at um, USC, um, and then you know, in terms of other outreach, putting it on the radio, putting it in the newspaper, uh, I it, it's challenging. It's challenging with vets because they don't necessarily want to come out. Um, it's a matter of trust, and um, so this is an ongoing challenge for military and we have to we're still in the midst of being figuring out okay how can we gain the trust of veterans that are isolated or don't want to come out so um we're in, it's an ongoing process things like barbecues and you know we're going to implement focus groups but in terms of what has worked so far is partnering with other organizations Yes, I also agree. Um, partnering with organizations really saved me because um, I, I thought I knew what people wanted and what I, I know what I know what people want. I could do this, you know, but I don't know what, what people want. So um, really, you know, I worked with Access California. I worked with the Arab Civil Council. I worked with a country called um, Syria, and they really helped me kind of define my project, and they really helped me, um, you know, with my project. I also worked with a local gentleman in the bookstore um, and he owns a bookstore and I, I sat down and we asked him questions and we asked him, you know, and we really got his feedback. And I, you know, I had these ideas that I wanted and then he was like, no, no, you shouldn't. So, I mean, it really, that really helped me out. I also, you know, I used the design process and, you know, I, I took the surveys, I went into the community, you know, I, I visited the dry cleaners, the bookstore, the restaurants, you know, um, I went to the grocery store and, and went to this Arab grocery store and, you know, like my black self went in there and I was like, okay, you know, I'm just going to go in there. I'm going to, you know, just go in and, and ask some questions and hopefully, you know, you know, so it, it took a lot of, um, it really humbled me and it really just, um, I, I was happy to do it, you know, but you really have to like, not, you know, you don't know everything. You think you know everything, but you don't. So please, you need to partner and you need to ask the community really what they want. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing. So yeah, partnerships, overcoming your own sort of assumptions or mm -hmm. like respecting your, your audience. Um, I think those are valuable tips for everyone. Um, a second question sort of building off of this, um, what about obstacles? You know, were there any specific obstacles other than what you've mentioned that you've that you encountered, and how how did you problem solve and troubleshoot and overcome those obstacles? I think for me is waiting on people because a lot of people say like they're interested in doing something, and then they're like really like oh we want to do it we want to help you out but then they never like return your call or they never email you back and you find yourself emailing them over and over again. So it's really, it's working with people and just kind of, you know, um, just kind of waiting on people. Cause sometimes you're just at like, you're just waiting for them to just respond back to you. So that's, that's the hardest thing I think. And COVID, COVID was kind of hard too. <laughs> Cause that shut us down sometimes. And then, you know, our, our numbers were a little less than what it would be if it was just a regular time, but COVID too. I, I agree with uh, Karita because um, it's perseverance and patience and definitely not taking anything personally, um, you know, because uh, yeah, COVID 
COVID definitely put a wrench in uh, Art of Resilience because we thought we were going to do it live. Um, although it worked out financially better to do it online. So that was in a, in a way um, a relief and we were able to reach a broader audience by doing it online. But um, um, the obstacles for Miltree are always outreach. And, and um, right, right after this meeting, we have a board meeting and we set up an outreach, you know, we have an outreach committee and we're, you know, we're gonna hire, we have very limited funds, but we're gonna hire an outreach coordinator because as executive director, I basically don't have a staff. It's a very small organization. I have a working board. And not only are they a working board for military, they work in their own lives. So, you know, um, you know, it's come to the point where if military is going to be as effective as we want it to be, uh, we have to hire someone uh, and, and get a grant or whatever it takes to um, uh, fulfill our mission. So um, I, I think when, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, y'all, um, but when you are working with an underserved community, it really is about building trust. And again, I agree with you, Karita, in terms of, you know, I went in there with all my ideas and, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Well, not everybody was keen on that, you know, so flexibility is also you really have to be flexible to uh, allow an organization to grow and to prosper and you really have to be patient um yeah i think to echo uh, off of what both Sh uh, cheryl and Karita said um and this is a challenge I've, I've only just been able to articulate and it's um you know, you've heard that song, making new friends, keeping the old, like, how do you do that? And that's, I think for as museums and, and nonprofits, small nonprofits, how do you continue to make new friends, but you also have to keep the old friends and keep everybody engaged all of the time. And, you know, and that building trust and, and I've, you know, I've been in a number of institutions where I've gone through that process of building trust, knocking down some barriers, and then ultimately, you know, you feel like you can't fail, you can't fail them, right? Because now you've established that relationship and that connection, what's next, right? And, you know, um, that relationship has been manifest in, in a product, which is the project and the exhibition, but then what's next? And how are you gonna continue to manifest that relationship? Um, so that consistent follow-up and, and ma maintaining that collection connection, but as you know, we're the same small staff, even smaller post pandemic and how, you know, it's, it's, you know, you've opened up the floodgate of all of these, you know, these connections and the people and their stories and their dramas and, and, you know, do we have the resources to keep up with it all of the time and, and continue to keep them in the fold and invite them back continually. So that's, that's the part that weighs on my mind and it's always a challenge. I mean, the project, we, we don't ever want to think of a project, you know, I, I have an end, an end date that I stated, but it's, it didn't really end, right? Those connections are still happening and we're trying to find new ways into them and we're trying to find new friends. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tina. Um, I'm glad in this last round of questions, we heard a little bit more about your organizations. And so this next question is sort of larger institution, right? Not nonprofit world or the history center, the libraries. Um, what, what are some of the, the lessons uh, that you that you learned in terms of your project and how that impacted, you know, how your organization operates? I'll take this real quick. I've pretty much said it. Um, the lessons that, you know, I just, I came off another project just recently, um, uh, more of an art project, and it was fabulous. Um, however, you know, we had more community, you know, Miltree incorporates veterans into community. So I had no problem with community showing up. They always do. But, you know, it became very clear just by boots on the ground, so to speak, Okay, this is when I realized it's like, wow, this is a really great um, uh, art art uh, workshop thing we did, um, but the veterans aren't showing up like the community is showing up. So that's why you know it's it's really trial and error in a sense. So I learned on my feet. It's like, oh, duh! It became I became very aware that maybe even the words arts and dialogue 
for this particular community for veterans, maybe those aren't the words that I use. Maybe it's shared experiences, shared stories, you know, um, and we're, again, uh, we're in the process of figuring this out, but um, each time we do a project, we learn. What I learned from Art of Resilience, which was fantastic, is that um, we can do online stuff. You know, I mean, COVID's not going away anytime soon, I guess. <laughs> I'm so tired of it. But um, we we actually have an ongoing weekly writing workshop through Milltree that has veterans going weekly along with civilians. And we plan to um, maybe do an art project or a, you know something with shared experiences. So what I've learned is that when you have lemons, you make lemonade, you adjust. Again, we have to be flexible. And I also just wanted to say that um, collaboration for me, I forgot to say this through um, the colleges. The, uh, for me, it's community colleges along with um, uh, Cal State San Bernardino, um, you know, the different colleges and universities are a great resource for outreach and collaboration. I forgot to say that. Thank you. Tina or Karina, did you have any clarifying thoughts on the idea of operational impact that in terms of lessons learned from your project? Um, yes, I mean, I think it helped set and initiated us to set set up on a path of of collecting um, in all kinds of different ways um, from from contemporary communities and being more in a in an active role as a history museum rather than a passive role of accepting whatever you know when somebody's grandmother dies and giving us their stuff in the attic. Um, you know, about like, and being intentional about, about going after, going after that and articulating it and defining it. So for example, tomorrow we have a community collection and scanning event um, around Juneteenth to go along with our Celebrate Black History and Heritage exhibition. And it's, it's that less, you know, those lessons learned from, you know, participation in this California Humanities project that help us learn and grow as, a, as an organization to do, embark on, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I think for me, um, libraries are critical connectors um, for communities and people want to be seen and they want to be heard and they want to be celebrated. And we have the opportunity to do that at the library. Um, I, I also, I, I see that there needs to be an ongoing, you know, celebration of this culture, not just during like a month or during a, you know, just a grant period time. So we do have an ongoing, um, we have an Arabic story time like in a couple weeks still. Um, but, you know, people, again, they want to be celebrated, they want to be represented. And, and that's why I really kind of, you know, um, that's why I took away from this, you know. Okay, thank you, Karita. Um, so this is the final question, um, sort of, you know, parting advice. Um, you know, what advice would you offer organizations, you know, folks who are on, on the call, uh, looking to expand their audience, right, to new and underserved groups? What would be your advice to them? I would say be authentic. Um, if you're going to do it, be authentic. Um, don't do something that's not real because the community can tell that it's not real. Um, be authentic and just don't do it for like the grant period or because, you know, it's for a month. Do it because you want to do it and you want to learn more about the culture and, and, and whatnot. So I would just say be authentic. Um, I think I covered most of my, my big tips, but um, aside from that, um, creating layers, thinking of your thing as layered, however that can mean to you, and multiple points of access, right? Don't assume that the point of access that you have in mind or that you've created is the way that people are going to want to engage or, or want to provide you know, their, their um, input, but have different ways of, for people to participate because you know, we all bring our different gifts, so. I, I agree with Tina. Um, you know, it, it takes a village and, um, you know, um, 
when somebody comes up with an idea, really explore it. Um, also, you have to have the never give up spirit. Um, running a nonprofit is not easy. It's not for sissies. I'll tell you that. It's, um, I can't tell you how many times that I was, I'm like, well, maybe it's time to like close the doors. And then I, and then I get a grant or, or somebody, you know, comes to me with something and I go, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to, you know, we're going to keep going. Um, but, you know, I think um, explore right now, for example, I'm going to be very specific. You know, I'm going to explore where I can have meet and greets. I have a chiropractor that serves a lot of veterans and they have a veteran liaison, you know, on the premises. And the chiropractor said, well, Tuesday and Thursday nights, you can use the space. So it's like you take advantage of every opportunity you can and and you really, how can I put this? You can't be lazy about it. You know, um, you, you it, it's perseverance and, you know, you have to find a way to excite yourself through the hard times. Um, you know, and, and like I said, I've I've tried to quit this, you know, and it's just, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, you know, but, um, but um, even though um, Miltry is very small and we, and we do struggle, I mean, it, you know, we, we do, I told you, you know, the outreach is our big thing now. Um, I still have the passion to continue. And as long as I like the word authentic, as long as you authentically care about the group that you're serving, you know, whether it's, you know, um, a, a, a community at large or, you know, um, um, you know, veterans or, you know, the Arab community or whatever it is, you know, you know, check in with yourself. Does this matter? You know, can you do the work? Because getting resentful and getting weird, it's not worth it. You know, you have to, you really have to be authentic about what you're doing. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Well, um, we've reached the moment in the hour where we're going to take some audience questions. And I believe, Kirsten, there are several, I think, in the Q&A. Uh, did you want to uh, handle those? Hey, yeah, thanks, Oliver. And thanks, everyone. I feel like you've addressed a lot of the questions so far, but there are some really good ones in here I want to get to. Um, Someone named Ela wrote in and asked if you have any tips for translating these kinds of events to the virtual world. Well, you just do it. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, it, it's the, the tip is get somebody that knows how to work the virtual world. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take this over, but that, I mean, we just literally just went, okay, we're adjusting, you know, we have done workshops online. We have done, we've done writing workshops, yoga workshops. I mean, you can definitely do this stuff online. Um, and, but yeah. the hard part is, you know, getting people to sign up, I guess. I think the, you know, um, we, we basically switched over within a couple of weeks. Um, and because we had to, you can't, you can't stop. And fortunately the bar was, was really low for online stuff in the beginning. So it was a good time to, to jump in, right? You didn't, you didn't have to have a nicely produced, beautiful event online because everybody was just figuring it out. And I think letting go of, of the idea of perfection and of, and a slick, highly produced something or other, I'm a big advocate for just getting stuff out there and just seeing what happens, really. And then learning from it and then iterating. The only thing I would add to that is taking things to the people, you know, not not creating something, even something virtual, right? If you're if you're making a virtual exhibit, you know, it's worth also trying to budget to do that the traveling exhibit that can go into a place that has COVID protocols if you're trying to hit, you know, a specific uh, community. Great. Um, we had another question here kind of about troubleshooting. It says, did any of you encounter pushback from a participant who was wary of having their story used or shared? If so, how did you adjust or address those concerns? Waivers. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's really simple. Um, I mean, I'm not making light of it, but, you know, if they sign a waiver, you know, you put it very clearly that this is going to be shared, 
you know, and, you know, um, and they need to knew th know that up front. For example, we did do a um, anthology for the art of resilience. And there were some people that were not into having their story in the anthology and that was fine. You know, that, that was totally fine. You know, um, uh, I think you don't share when somebody doesn't want you to share, you know, mm -hmm. you respect that. Yeah. I mean, with it, within the field of oral history, there's a set of um, best practices. And, and one of those is, is around informed consent. And you sit down with the person and you go through what the process is going to be about and where their discomfort is and what they, how involved they want to be and where they're comfortable, whether they're comfortable in basically donating their story and, and having it shared. And um, so that has to happen, you know, at the beginning of, of that. Um, for most people, for us, for our project, it was like, it's about damn time. <laughs> you know, what took you so long to come to me? Um, I, I think with the Kumeyaay oral history part, and, and this is where having um, people that are well embedded within that community uh, that are that are out there as part of the project, um, I, I think there was some resistance, but I think being, you know, having that contact and those connections helped ultimately with, with that. Awesome. Um, someone else was wondering about funding. You know, how do you get not just the grants like the ones you've all received now from California Humanities, but also community sponsorships, in you know, in-kind donations, good services? Could each of you say a little bit about that? Um, I just write letters. Um, I call people. Um, I just you know, that's how I get it. I, I or go in person and ask somebody and you get a lot of no's and then you're like really surprised when you get that yes. But yeah, you just have to be persistent with it and just like call, write, you know, go in person and just tell them what you're trying to do. And, you know, you'll find somebody to help you out. Um, I, I, I agree. I mean, um, we, uh, I do a fundraiser called Live from Joshua Tree, which is a spoken word event, and that's a time when I go to local businesses and I ask them to sponsor the show. And just what that does is if a lot of my costs are covered for the show, then the ticket sales can go towards funding programs and go into the organization, you know, but by, by approaching, you know, different businesses or other local organizations um, or like your city council, like I just got $2,000 um, from the city of 29 Palms and we're going to do a yoga retreat for women for PTSD, for PTSD, you know, um, you know, and, you know, um, it's called a CDBG grant, for example, you know, but maybe in different communities, it's, I don't know, it's different, but, um, you know, um, the more you show up at different um, affairs in your counties or towns, the more they get to know you and, um, you know, you go in there and you tell them who you are. Yeah, she's not on the call anymore, but uh, when Emily was saying that she's having some trouble raising funds in Bakersfield, I'm like, what? To bring that film to Bakersfield? I, I, I'm picking up the phone. I'm, I'm sending emails on her behalf. So <laughs> showing up uh, helps. <laughs> Great. Well, I think showing up is probably the headline from what all of you have been saying over the last hour. So Thank you so much. I think we're getting to that time um, where we're gonna be wrapping up. So I just wanna share some closing remarks here. As Julie Fry mentioned, today's program is part of a series called Tools of the Trade. Uh, this series is supported by the American Rescue Plan and the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities as part of our goal to strengthen the public humanities field in the wake of COVID-19. We have one more uh, program lined up in this series. It's called Increasing Your Visibility with Decision Makers and the Media. That's going to be on August 18th, so please join us. Our colleague Beth is putting an RSVP link in the chat. Hope to see you there. And if you haven't already done so, please sign up for California Humanities free monthly newsletter. This is where we announce grant opportunities, programs, and lots of other ways to get, in, get involved and find some support for your projects. 
And please do let us know if you have any feedback about today's program. We're coming to the end of the series and we're always curious to hear, you know, what is of interest to our community? What do you wanna hear about? So in closing, thank you so much to our presenters, Cheryl, Karita, Tina, Emily, and to our moderator, Oliver, for keeping it all together, to my colleagues behind the scenes, and Julie Fry, our president and CEO, as well as Felicia Kelly, who runs this series, and Beth Segura, who helped out so much today in the chat, and our colleagues in the communications department, uh, Sheree and Steven, who made all the graphics for the event. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, all right, good night, everyone, and we hope to stay in touch.